Hey, let's just ask the Lord to guide our, our time together. Uh, so, Father, we do ask for your Spirit's guidance today. This is a room full of people called in various fashions to lead the church, to pastor the church, to shepherd the church, whether it's in worship or in preaching or missions or however it may be. So as we try to have an understanding today about, about how you how you call the leadership of the body to work together for kingdom purpose, we ask that you guide our, our conversation. Uh, and it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. So the I want to try to do three things and then uh, just turn it over and let you kind of guide the conversation or question, answer, or whatever. Um, but I'm kind of going at the question from this. Why is the relationship between the pastor and the worship leader so difficult? Or why can't it be so difficult? I'm going to kind of assume the question and not try to prove that. Um, I had visited with a pastor. I won't name any names, but made the statement, you know, Martin Luther said when Satan fell from heaven, he landed in the choir loft. <laughs> I don't know if Martin Luther actually said that, but I think that the pastor, yeah. the pastor quoted that says something about inheritably the relationship that is is there. So I just want to kind of talk a little bit about that. I want to tell you my story uh, to put everything that I'm going to say in context. Uh, I want to try to offer some reasons of why I think that relationship can be troublesome and then maybe talk about some solutions, things we can do to change that and then open it up for a conversation and y'all can uh, we can talk about that uh, together. So just uh, my story so you know where my comments are coming from. I I'm a lifelong Baptist. I was attending a Baptist church before I was born. So, so I'm talking about the relationship between worship leader and pastor from, totally from a Baptist perspective. So if you're Presbyterian or Catholic or something, I don't know, your world's different. But, but I'm coming from a, from a Baptist perspective. I grew up in a, a large church. So we had a worship leader that was uh, theologically trained and musically trained, Paul Paschal. I don't know if any of you all know the name Paul Paschal. Uh, he was, when I tell my faith story, he's one of those individuals that was influential in my spiritual development. So I have a, a lot of affinity for, for Paul Paschal. I went to Baylor to go to college. My my first church position was at a small little church. I was a student minister, a junior in college. Uh, so it was a a single staff church, paid pastor. The guy who was leading music, Ron, the accountant, was a great guy. Uh, no musical training, no theological training, uh, but he was was willing to to lead music. So that that was Ron. Uh, come up to seminary. I was an intern at a church where the music leader, the worship leader, was a friend of mine. He was also a student minister. Uh, again, he had no formal music training, no theological training, but he had music ability. Uh, and he had a good heart, and so he served served that church well. Graduate, I go to my first church, San Angelo, Texas. There's 26 people in the room. Uh, Ronnie is the worship leader. Mary, his wife, plays piano. I think it's charitable to say Ronnie has no musical training, no theological training, nor any music ability. Uh, I think that'd be fair. For, he was just willing to do it. Somebody had to do it. Now, Mary uh, could bang out the hymns. Uh, and I literally mean bang out the hymn. So our, our musicology in that church was a pretty narrow little stripe. Uh, but he was faithful. He was there. Every, he was a rancher. Uh, his suit was probably older than Moses, but he wore it faithfully every every Sunday. So uh, went back to Waco, pastored the same church where I was a student minister in college. At this time, Ron was still there, one of our deacons, but felt like it was time that we had we paid somebody. So we hired someone who was a band director at a uh, school, local high school. So he had musical training, didn't have any theological training. Um, and to be fair, he didn't have a whole lot of ministry ability either. So that relationship kind of with the church kind of blew up because of that as, as well. From there, I went to First Baptist Church, Augusta, Georgia. I was minister to young families there, large church. I was the 10th full-time pastor. The uh, worship leader there, uh, Stan, you know, Stan, same last name, no relation, Stan Pilot, had a PhD. Nothing like <laughs> PhD, so he was musically trained, theologically trained, and had a lot of music ability as well. Uh, then I've come back to First Baptist Benbrook, where I've been for the last 19 years. And so now we're one of those weird churches. We have two worship services. We have a traditional service, a contemporary service. Contemporary service, Tim's been there for 11 years. 
Uh, he's working on his master's now. Uh, and so he's got theological training. Uh, he has musical ability. I don't know about formal music training, but he's got music ability. Uh, Dr. Kreider leads our traditional service. So uh, theological training, musical training, some music ability. I think we'd say So that's kind of the scope. As I, as I say some of the things that I'm about to say, you can put it in, well, that's just his experience. Okay, that's what my experience has been. So why do I think, why is it that the relationship between pastor and worship leader can be troublesome or be difficult? Uh, so here just, I, I graduated from seminary in 1993. And I cannot remember, and if Dr. Dilday was here, my president, he would, might disagree with me, but I cannot remember having a single class where we talked about the theology of worship. There wouldn't have been back then. So as silly as that is, I spent 96 hours on this campus, credit hours, three and a half years. And the main thing that we do as a church, when we gather together, the main thing that every church does is meet for an hour to worship once a week. And nowhere in that 96 credit hours was there ever really a class to challenge me to think theologically about what is it we're doing or should be doing during that hour. Now, I hope that's changing, uh, but that's just... That's just kind of where it was. So, so what that means is I graduated from seminary and launched on the field, never really thinking or being challenged to think in any kind of theological way of what's supposed to be happening. What's supposed to be happening in, in that worship hour, okay? Uh, so you take that. Um, I, I did have one class, the history of church music, where I think we, we learned is the, the hymns. The only thing I remember about learning in that class is to do this and technically to push out on that. That's, that, that was all I learned from that class is to, to push out on the way of never use that skill uh, in worship. But that's pretty well with that. <laughs> yeah, yep, sign them up. Well, I got three hours credit. It took a lot to get there. So, so yeah, I don't, maybe, I don't know. Maybe it was one hour. I don't know. Um, Add to that, when I was a student here, theology students were in one building, music students were in another building, and never the two shall, shall meet. I remember when I went to my history of church music class, I felt like I was in foreign territory. They spoke a different language. The building was different. It was just like, these people are weird. You know, they're way over there and we're way over here. And so there is this unstated sense of the separation between, between the two. Y'all are over there. We're over here. So you add that to so graduate from seminary as pastor. You've never really been challenged to think theologically about, hey, what's supposed to be taking place in this hour? You don't really have any connection with the music world because they're in a whole different building, speaking a whole different language. And so when, when I get to my first church, I fell into a paradigm. I don't know where I picked up the paradigm. I'm sure I was never taught it. I'm sure seminary said this is the way you're supposed to do it. I just fell into it. Just like a fish in water, this is the way that it goes. And you probably know how the paradigm goes, right? The music guy takes care of the first part. I'll pick up when I preach. You come back into the invitation, and then I'll handle announcements and the end. I don't know where I learned that. Certainly, y'all don't teach that, right? I hope. Uh, but that's just the paradigm that, that I fell into. So I get into Dove Creek, and here's Ronnie. Uh, he's going to bang out two hymns. We're going to take an offering. Uh, and Ronnie just does whatever he's going to do. I'll come up and I'll preach. Uh, we'll suffer through one song of invitation and then we'll go home. Uh, and so what that means is what's taking place in the worship hour, we have two different worlds going on in the same hour. If you're lucky, sometimes those two different realities are headed somewhat the same direction. But most of the time, they're not. Most of the time, they were just... Some, some random hymns, well, not random hymns, but hymns from our common songs that we like, uh, just kind of put together that have really nothing to do, even maybe even with each other or with a worship theme or the sermon or anything. You do your thing, 
I'll, I'll do my thing. So again, that's, that's kind of the paradigm that I just fell into because I never really had been challenged or even just had the thought, what exactly are we supposed to be doing during, during this hour? And so you understand that that inherently now breeds a, a world where we have this division and this divide between the two things that are, that are going on. Now, add to that that all of us who are called into ministry, one of the, the biggest spiritual battles that we find is the battle of pride. When you lead a worship service and someone comes up afterwards and says, you know, that was the greatest sermon I ever heard, or that was the greatest choir special ever, or the music was great. Uh, it, it is just our ego wants to hear that, that we're great. They're really praising, hey, it was really good to be in the presence of God today, wasn't it? Right. They're not really saying anything about us, but our ego wants to hear it that they're saying about us. And pastors are susceptible to that, and worship leaders are as well. So, so we are both battling pride and ego that's, that's being fed by the enemy. Add to that, and I hope this statement is not a, a offensive, but I think by and large it's right. Music people and theology people are kind of typically on different ends of the spectrum personality-wise. Y'all are creative, artistic. We're thinkers you know, logical people. I know that's a, that's an overgeneralization, but but basically what that means is we're very different people. So we we look at problems differently. We we just look at life differently. So you throw that into the mix, uh, and what you end up with is a, a scenario or a world where uh, the the relationship that's going on between those two can be can be fraught. Uh, so also the worship that takes place in the hour is very divided and bifurcated and, and not, not a unified thing that's happening. You do your thing, I'll do my thing. Probably your thing and my thing, now we're gonna have any kind of interaction together. Uh, what, what you could hope for, at least in the old paradigm, uh, special music, does that communicate to anybody? The world of special music, okay. Uh, typically means singing to a cassette tape to a Sandy Patty song. Uh, yeah, I remember that name, right? Uh, uh, you're hoping that maybe there's enough foreplanning that the special music might have something to do with the sermon, but you kind of really have to plan plan that out. But usually there's just this, 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 this huge, huge break. Um, and... And it's really the the other thing that adds to that, you know, when Jesus prays his high priestly prayer. He, one of the things that he's praying for is that there would be unity in the body so that the world would know that the father sent the, the son. There is something about the church being united that proclaims to the world that the father sent the son. And so if the enemy can sow discord at that very core relationship of pastor and worship leader and to get a division there and really fracture that division that hinders our ability, our gospel witness to the world that the Father has, has sent the Son. So all that to say, this is also a very key uh, spiritual warfare spot. The enemy is going at this relationship on purpose to try to, to dilute the, the gospel message. So you put all that in a pot and, and stir it up. It's not real surprising that the relationship between pastor and worship leader can, can be difficult. So how, uh, how can we change it? Or how can we in, improve? Certainly, you know, our training as, as pastors uh, uh, to be, you know, theologically trained about worship. Uh, it's one of the neat things that y'all are doing with School of Worship is really focusing on the theology of, of worship and what it is that is supposed to be happening during this hour. I don't know if that's making it over to the theology school. Is it uh, getting there or not? It's, it's an elective. It's not okay. I mean, that's hopeful. hopeful. Yeah, the Southwestern Journal of Theology, we got to do all worship articles this semester. So okay. Semester. That is good. I mean, that's it really is unfortunate that you can graduate from seminary and be prepared to be a pastor and not really have a class on the theology of a worship service. 
you know, when you just say it out loud, it sounds really embarrassing. But that's kind of where we got, get a lot of classes on preaching and theology and all that kind of stuff. But what actually should we be doing during this hour when we gather together? Uh, so, you know, we need to train, we need to have a, a unified theology of worship that the the pastor and the worship leader share and, and are on the same page uh, together. Uh, it, it really would be nice if there were a required class that you had theology students and music students in the same room who were having to talk about the theology of worship together uh, and really hammering that together. So if y'all can make that happen, that would that would be good. Um, secondly, we, we all have to, as individual worship leaders or ministry leaders, we all have to really battle this thing called pride uh, constantly, constantly, constantly. Uh, we, you know, if this has a much better chance of having a good relationship if both individuals really are in it for the glory of God and not for their for their own glory. Uh, if one is not, whether it's pastor or worship leader, it's it's just going to really make this relationship very very difficult. But if you've got both who really get it, that the whole point here of the church is to exalt the name of Christ. God's called us here and used us to do that. Every gift that we have to try to make that happen is something that God's given to us, and we really have no right to brag about. You know, uh, if you're a good musician or I'm a good preacher, that's just a gift that God has given to us. We have no right to claim that as our own and to brag about it. It's just a gift that God's given to us, uh, and we give glory to Him. And so, but you really have to fight that. That is a lifelong battle of. Of, of fighting against ego and fighting against against pride. Uh, and if, if you're sitting here today thinking, well, that, that really doesn't challenge me. I'm a pretty humble person. You know, Scripture says, take heed. He, he who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. Uh, the enemy will come, come at you for that. Uh, so we've got to fight that. Both of us have to fight that. Um, from a pastor's perspective, one of the things that I've had to learn, if... If I want the worship service to have a unified sense to it and not just a you do your thing, then I'll do my thing, then I'm going to have to do a much better job about uh, sermon planning much further out so that I can give the worship leader, this is the text for this day, this is what I think that the essence of this sermon is going to be about. You know, the worship leader's got to have that in hand long enough to be to think about it and pray about it and begin to explore because that person's also probably got to train some musicians or some singers or whatever to make that happen so you know it's not enough on tuesday afternoon to say i figured out what the sermon is on sunday so when you come together on wednesday you know you can get your choir uh so i i'm trying to to grow on that i, I try as best i can to three months out for my worship leaders to not only know what the, the text is, but to have a, a paragraph summary of where I think that that sermon is going. So that they've got in hand three months in advance to be able to look at that and pray over that and think about that and begin to dream about what, how could we craft a worship service that's, that's going to get there. So the, there's some challenge there for the pastors. If we really want this to be unified, we've got to do more long-term planning. Um, which not all, you know, not all pastors do. So a uh, challenge. Uh, one of the things I've also been trying to improve recently uh, is to try to do a better job of connecting the sermon to the song of response. Um, used to be, you know, just in the sermon, now let's sing our, sing our invitation. But to try to, in a very more specific way, why are we about to sing the song that we are about to sing? And how does the song help us to respond to all of that God has been saying to us this, this morning? And whether that's pulling key lyrics out of that song and saying, this is why we're singing this. or But, but for me to do a better job of connecting the sermon to the song that we're singing in response is, is part of trying to make this a unified worship experience that it's all, it's all kind of coming together. So I'm trying to learn and grow in that uh as well um so i've got i've got one word of, of challenge and one word of encouragement i guess this is my one shot i, I want to shoot my shot i guess right the worship leaders i've had the best relationship with in ministry are the guys uh, the worship leaders that get it 
And by get it, I mean they understand that their calling and role in, in ministry is not confined to the stage. I've served with worship leaders, and they really think all that they do is, is on the stage with the musicians and the singers, and uh, when the lights go off, their ministry is, is over. The worship leaders that I've served with that have, have been the best to work with understand they've been called to be a minister of the church, not just, I mean, their primary role is to lead in worship, but it's not confined to that. And so these are the guys that are, you know, they've got a, they do a booth in trunk or treat, or they're, they've got a, they're teaching three-year-olds in vacation Bible school. They're, they're finding a way to be part of the larger essence and ministry of the church. They, they get it. They've been called to minister to the church as a whole, and it's not just on the stage. So that'd be my encourage to y'all. Please don't just kind of see your ministry as confined to the stage. You're called to serve the, the entire, entire church. The encouragement I, I would give to you is, as pastor, I need you to, to lead me in worship. I need to, for you to lead me in worship to get to my own sermon. Let me explain what I'm talking about. That there, there is a sermon development process, uh, and I won't go through all of that, but it's really not even complete until the Sunday morning worship experience. So it's this weird, weird thing, right? If, if, if Dr. Brown's going to lead worship on Sunday and I've, I've get him, this is the text. Like Sunday, we're doing Romans 8, 28, that great promise. I'm preaching through Romans 8. So this is like week 11 out of Romans 8. But we're now to verse 28. God causes all things to work together for good. So you, you've had that for three months. You've seen my, my summary about what, what it is. So you've, you've chosen a scripture to, to guide the worship service. You've chosen songs to, to engage us and to lead us up to that. You've thought about what, what is a song of response to when we come out of Romans 8, 28, how do we make it convey? You know, so you've put all of that together based upon what I've given you at the beginning. And yet, when it comes to Sunday morning, I've, I've written the sermon, I've planned the sermon, I've chosen the text, all of that. I still need to get there through the worship that, that you're putting together. I still need to arrive at Romans 8, 28 through the scripture that you've selected, through the songs that you have selected, through the worship service. Uh, I, I, I can't just, you know, step out of my office and step into the sermon and for it to really be spirit filled. I've got I need you to lead me in worship to get to my own sermon, if that makes sense. So we we need you to lead us in worship, not just to lead the congregation in worship. So we need you to lead me in worship so I can get to my own sermon. I hope that makes, makes some degree of sense uh, of whatever. Um, and just encourage you, how many of y'all are, are on staff right now as a worship leader? Okay. Uh, I won't ask you to say how many of y'all have a good relationship with your pastor now. <laughs> okay. You may not be, you're probably not going to be best friends with, you know, the pastor worship leader may not be, be best friends. Um you can't really assign friends that way, but we need to have a good working friendship and we need to have a good ministry friendship in the sense that, that we value what the other person is bringing to, to the church and to the kingdom uh, and understand what it is that, that we're striving to do. So I don't know if that frames the conversation at all or whatever, but... There's so many things that you're saying that are uncommon amongst a long line of pastors that I've served with and known in different churches all over the Southern Baptist Convention. Okay, like like what? You, you have a, a uniquely high esteem for the complementary roles that we're talking about and for worship in general because of that setup for disconnect that you described. Um, it's uh, you, 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 you are you are amongst as far from a worship leader perspective, uh, you are a very very special person. Okay, can I ask you to elaborate without naming names? But most of these, these so we're going to go out and be get jobs at churches that we worship, and we're going to work with pastors. And you're saying that the majority of them 
are going over my to, lifetime. Over right, right. My we're just talking out of our experience. Yeah. But you're saying the majority of them are going to be more like what? Um, let's see. The, the first church I served as a 19 year old, um, I was given an, uh, an order of service with blanks to fill in for the hymns. And the pastor told me that if I made anyone mad, that he was, that I was going to be making my own bed to lie in it okay. and that he was not going to be there to rescue me. Mm -hmm. And so I better not uh, mess up. All right. And um, the first church I served out of uh, seminary, um, I got, I got yeah. a couple of weeks ahead. I got a, um, he got more, a little more than that, but but he he was pretty good about um, telling me what he's going to preach on. But he he not that concerned about about what I did, um, as long as I could tame some of the personality problems that were in the choir. Mm -hmm. um, the next church I serve. Okay, and what's interesting is these are the problem because I'll, these churches all okay. had. Each of the, uh, the first two churches I served, I served with more than one pastor. I, I don't, you could read all sorts of other things in, on that, but, um, You're right. but these are the ones that I'm remembering. I've, I've served with, with pastors that, that, um, that gave me really great um, preparation curves, like, like, again, that three month out thing. Um, I've served with pastors that completely didn't care about the music. I've served with pastors that in our worship planning meetings would, I had very little input to choosing songs or doing anything because they practically did it for me um, and everywhere in between. And it's, okay. um, I've served with pastors that came that in multiple services that they, um, they popped in to the sanctuary um, in the middle of the song right before the sermon. And I've served in churches where the pastors are there worshiping the whole time. Um, been in churches where the pastor wants to meet to talk about, you know, about the services, you know, kind of a debrief as we look to the next week. Um, ones that they seem to not think about it at all. Um, it, it's just all over the map. It's just all over the map. And I, um, there are there are a lot of a lot of responsibilities that you carry as senior pastor that no matter how involved and pastorally we think as worship pastors, we're not dealing with the same stuff that you're dealing with. And I've tried to tell the students that that, you know, pastors are frequently if, if the pastor has to talk to you about something, it's probably because not he heard about it once, but because there was there were several people that have said something and he's thinking, okay, this is not isolated and, and, and we need to, 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 to uh, pull everybody together on it because of the, the hits that you're willing to take for your staff. Right. And um, so it, it's just all over the place, but having that genuine care, personal care for the, for the theology and the, just the, the bedrock reality of, of what worship is, is to be is, not common it's just still not common we can blame it on our seminary programs or whatever but um right. it is what it is yeah uh one thing i thought of while you're talking it's it's helpful I, I do think the pastor is the lead worshiper of the church yes um and so it, it is it is helpful if if the worship leader understands that as well, in other words, kind of the, the hierarchy and pecking order. Who's right. who's number one? Who's number two? If if everyone understands that, it makes it much easier for me. Like I think part of my role, like when we started our contemporary worship service, how many gripes did I get about what Tim wore? <laughs> you know, and just it, it's you know I think I thought it was my job just to shield that and take all of that. He didn't need. He didn't need to hear all that um, and hopefully to, to protect him from that. But I, but I could do that because 
I had a good relationship with with Tim and we didn't have any turf wars and you know I could have his back because I knew that he you know he was in submission and all that kind of stuff so having that having that order kind of firm on both sides allows us to you know support each other in the right right way where we, where we need to so how about y'all y'all uh, have any uh just kind of relationships that you've had with your, the pastors you serve with or or things that you've learned that have made that relationship good or a struggle? Yeah. So I, the first couple of churches that I worked at didn't have great relationships with the senior pastor and now have a really great relationship. But as I look back on it, I can't really think of anything in the interview process mm -hmm. that could have tipped me off one way or the other. Um, right. Do you have any advice on like, being able to tell if a senior pastor or worship pastor are going to be helpful for each other? When you figure that out, if you could email that to me, I would. <laughs> My rule right now was just to not let Tim or Joe go. That's all I <laughs> finally found. Uh, you know, I know some mistakes that I think I have made going into churches and church and in, in search processes. Um, I feel like that I have felt like I've done every, especially these days with, with services all on video. It used to be that the only time a search committee or pastor could see or hear you was if they went to try to sneak in the back to, right, you right. know, but now it, everything's online. So, I mean, as my life has went on, has gone on all the videos, all the, the phone calls, all the, and then as I've, you know, gotten more mature, all of the things I've written, all of the, I mean, to like, look, this is who I am. This is what, you know, and then the thought of, okay, understand that now that they understand who I am, not only am I trying to see if I fit there, but clearly they're trying to see if I fit them and that this is going to, that they want who I am, but what I failed to predict in my last church was that, and this is after serving in ministry for a long time, is realizing that some churches will look at you, they will look at you strictly based on what they see you doing musically. And they will be thinking, can that person do the musical tasks that we require of them? And will they come off as being relatively ministerial to people? Mm. And and I believe in hindsight that was that was more or less what that particular pastor and that particular search committee was looking at with me. And as they got to know my heart was just at a little different place than they were. Mm. Um, I mean, I I and then there's another dynamic at work. I. I absolutely, I'm, I'm falling in submission to my pastor and to do what's going on, but, but for, for some people, and maybe it's in a, a, a pastor staff dynamic, maybe it's in another sort of dynamic. Um, it, it became, in, it became, uh, apparent to me that it wasn't, it did not completely fulfill my pastor at a certain point that I was willing to go full out serving and sub in, in, along his lead with him knowing that in any way I was not 100% exactly where he was on every single thing. The fact that we were, that I was not exactly the way he was on every single thing was something that he struggled with. Yeah. And by the Lord's grace, the Lord called us not to go serve another church, but to come serve you all here at Southwestern. But yeah. that was um, our, our our last full-time ministry assignment was not going to be forever. Mm -hmm. Did God call us to some place? Did I misunderstand God's call to that church? No, because if I wouldn't have gone there, I wouldn't have done the PhD and I wouldn't be here with you now yeah. because that was what God wanted us to do. And lots of other things been played, but that was a, that the expectations, um, you know, that I think that was a disconnect and that was a, a well-intentioned disconnect, you know, right. and I, that, I, I don't. Well, that brings up, 
you know, another element in all this is leadership style. Mm -hmm. Um, so there are some, some pastors who are, who are very, very strong leaders. They build, they build big churches and big ministries. I'm not that kind of guy. So I'm guessing, uh, they probably micromanage. They want every little detail. They want to be controlled of every little detail. Um, they're probably not much fun to work with because they're so hard driven and you're either, you know, rowing the boat or get off the boat kind of, kind of guys. That's not my leadership style. Um, I, I, so I wrestle some with that because like if, if something in the church is not, is not doing exactly the way I would do it. Well, is it my role as pastor to make sure it's done the way I want it to be done? Or is it my role of pastor to recognize that this is the body of Christ and the spirit has given many gifts. And just because that's not how I would organize grief ministry. And, but the person that God's called to lead grief ministry, I don't really need to get in there and try to do it my way. I should be happy that God's brought someone there that's doing it their way, you know? So worship's kind of the same thing, you know? Uh, there's been a couple of times when I'm like, I don't like this song. There are but is there, yeah, I, I sing it. Does music right. have to be what what I like? Right. There, there are times week to week that I don't like all the Doctor Crocker songs. <laughs> you know, but but that doesn't mean that I can't. That it's it's not as cool. You know, it's like it, I don't have right. to. Right. I don't have to. Yeah. So so if you're if you're trying to submit to someone who's a micromanager and wants to control every little jot and tittle, and you're not okay with that that's another reason that relationships can, can be i don't think there's any way to know that yeah and going back to your question i don't know like when i first met when tim when, when tim came out 11 years ago and i first met him i if he was here i would say this he's got a little bit of a quirky personality <laughs> some of y'all know tim <laughs> y'all may know tim is that fair anybody uh so if just met him i would have not have thought i'm going to work really well with with this guy but over 11 years He's got a real heart for our church. He he gets it. He understands it. It's not just about the stage. He loves the church as a he whole. Loves he, you. he gets in he and he builds relationships with young uh, adults. I mean, he's easy to work with. I mean, I, I would not have known that from first time meeting him, the interview process. So I don't, I don't know how you how you get an interview process and you try to project that and figure out um, trusting the Lord, I guess. I don't know. Um, so this isn't exactly about the uh, relationship between pastor and worship, but also it kind of is. Um, so with y'all having two different types of uh, services, mm -hmm. uh, with the traditional and more contemporary, um, is there any type of plan in the future to kind of blend and that kind of thing, or... Is that just kind of set in stone? Like this is just the way our people are, and we're gonna do what they need or try to bring them in a different direction. What what are what are your views on that? Uh, if I were a really strong leader, I would be able to tell you I've got a really good plan and know exactly how that's. I really don't know. I really don't know. We started that um, 13, 14 years ago. Um, in all honesty, to, to solve a problem, our current worship uh, leader was, if, if I, I don't know, well, our current worship leader was not really effective. A narrow style band. A narrow style, okay. And we wanted to broaden, we were, we were an older grain church, mm -hmm. and we were trying to broaden to, to younger families, and that uh, person who was leading that service was not going to be able to lead the other service. So we, we started two, two different leadership. It solved that problem and has worked really well for us. Now that it's become successful, and now it's creating a different set of problems. So, uh, I, and I don't, I really don't know. Right now we got about a 60 40 split in terms of our attendance 60% go to traditional, 40% go to the contemporary service. Um, and to be honest, I don't I don't know what the future of that is. I don't have a plan for it. And then kind of as a follow-up, um, what kind of uh, 
functions do y'all do um, to bring everybody together? So we have one Sunday school, which is very uh, key to have one Sunday school where everyone's together. Uh, we have broader ministries like a, a WANA, where you got a lot of people serving from both services in the same area of ministry. Our discipleship groups tend to be populated by people from, from different services. Uh, we've got a united prayer meeting on Sunday night. It's probably about half and half in terms of those who are in which service come. Um, but that that is the problem, right? But, I mean, I think you would have the same problem if, you know, I was First Baptist Dallas and we had six identical services. You'd still have the same problem of how people are coming together and being one church. Having been in a lot of different places, um, one of the one of the things about Benbrook that is healthy when it could be unhealthy, um, it shares a quality with the church we served for 14 years near DC, where we had four services. Um, music was never when you when the style of the music is not your primary identifier as a member and worshiper and participant at a church and because because the the leadership has you know is is the same because there's so many things you do together because there's so many other ways to define who your relationship to the church besides the style of music you prefer i think that that helps to diminish the amount of you know choosing teams that can right. happen um and, and that happens by getting people from both services involved in doing the same thing together right right and and in some churches it 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 takes the the pastor and all the church staff working really hard to constantly be finding things that everybody does together because even if you are i mean uh, the church when we were in Virginia, there were there were three contemporary and one traditional services, but all of them had about the same attendance, and the hour they went was based on preference slash their when their small group met, mm -hmm. and you know so people it's like what service do you go to, and they'd say the hour they wouldn't say I go to contemporary or traditional because we blew that out of the water by having you know more than two services. Mm -hmm. Well, here it's not. It's it's more like what Sunday school class are you in, right. right? And that's that's a really cool thing, but it has to really be led by by your pastor and this guy's doing it. Yeah, and like the like our Christmas Eve service, we we'll have one Christmas Eve service, and both Tim and Joe will work together to incorporate, you know, both teams into that that one service. Uh, Tenebrae service is saying and one trunk or treat, one yeah. <laughs> Right, anybody else have a, an experience with pastor or relationship or yeah? I was just curious. The idea of unified services is cool. Um, you know, I think it's a good a lot of people try to go after, but um, the kind of the block point is where, where do you do you, you always decide it's best for the pastor to decide on the unified service that ends with the service or anything like that, or would that be something that could be given to your worship pastor? Or what are the roadblocks with that pastor is leading the church? What, what are the complexities of the unified service? Uh, so you're talking about deciding like what's going to be, what's going to be the worship theme for a given day? You mean like, like a special service? No, that just every, unified every, every Sunday. Sunday. Or any Sunday? Yeah. yeah. You're preaching the same sermon and yeah, he's talking about like the theme of the service, like um, as far as like who who makes the plan and what the theme is going to be. If you had a scripture guided service and right. one was band led and one was choir led, who decides who writes that that liturgy? Is that what you're saying? Well, Everybody. yeah, I think what what you're at, if I, I think the question you're asking is, whereas I'm doing sermon planning for the next three months and what our Christmas series is going to be. And I'm preaching through Leviticus in the, in the spring, which everybody's really excited about. Um, uh, but the laws are tutor to lead us to Christ. So there ought to be some way we can find Christ in that. Uh, so, but I'm doing all that plan. So your question is, you know, is it always me or do I ever turn that over to, to some 
someone else. Good question. I I think that that's my primary responsibility. There's times that I I involve others in in the like like Tim will preach some. Uh, I've done uh, sermon roundtables where I've had our student minister and children's minister involved in part of the presentation. But but I think that's my role in the church to be the one that's that's planning and, and scoping that out. I don't know. It always has to be that way. It's just no. I think it does. I think mm -hmm. that we saw God make that decision and demonstrate it strongly with the sons of Korah. You know, mm -hmm. so read that again. <laughs> In, in a kind of follow-up question, um, is the unified service so important that the pastor is a, not able to uh, due to time constraints or just decision making um, to actually come up with the sermons per Do you think it's still something that the worship pastor should start at? Or is it mostly just like if you get the sermon slides and you get the sermon Sunday mm -hmm. is it is it good to still try and achieve that, or is it something that's like a battle against all the fight? It's a really good question. I think we're out of time. Because uh, <laughs> I think what you're asking is what happens when you get a job at a church and the pastor doesn't doesn't give you any forward planning, or you know you're surprised by the sermon on Sunday morning as everyone else is, right? What do you what do you do with that? If you, I mean, it, it would be nice if you could talk to your pastor and say how hey, you know this is what i would like to do but i need some advanced planning but some guys they just that's not how they do sermon prep i mean when i first started i was i was preaching out of my devotional time so and that was sometimes week to week so i i wouldn't do any planning but but also that's because i was working out of a paradigm that you're going to do what i do and i'm going to do it you know uh, so sometimes it's breaking out of that that paradigm but i guess if you get to a spot where your pastor is just not willing to do that. And I guess you just got to do your best to do the scripture guide and have a theme, have a coherence. You can plan and lead biblical worship. And you find out that morning what he's preaching on and you look for ways in what you say, what you pray to make the connections you can make. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, I mean, I've, I've had pastors that plan everything out to give me a call Saturday night and say, I've been wrestling with this all week and I think God wants me to preach on this instead. And I know that's, you know, you don't have to change your service, but I just want you to be aware that everything you plan to aim towards something is like, it's not going to do that now. I'm like, that's fine. What is it? You know, the, and, and even sometimes that's saying, I'm changing it to this. Do you, is there, <clears throat> is there any way possible you can, you can, you can switch out the song before the sermon and do this song? Mm -hmm. Your job is to say, yes, pastor, mm -hmm. right. and you do what it takes, and you don't throw your pastor under the bus when you meet with your band the next morning. Mm -hmm. And also, <clears throat> thankfully, you know, the same spirit that's leading you is the same, will be the same spirit that's leading right. me. So there's been times where, even though I've scoped out the text, I'm preaching on this text, and here's my little summary of what I anticipate that the theme's going to be. To get there, and even though I'm still preaching that text, it's really a different point or different theme. But it's amazing, and sometimes that doesn't happen in the sermon development process until Thursday. You know, and at that point, it's there's there's no real point of trying to everything's kind of set. But it's also still amazing. You get there in Sunday morning worship, and it it's still all it still all works. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the Lord's putting all this together and it, it still works. I mean, not getting a hard left and we're going to do tithing today or uh, maybe, but, you know, the Spirit's leading. So I trust in that, too. Anything else, guys? Thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. Right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.